Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's EKU Chautauqua presentation. My name is Eric Liddell, Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator, and I'm delighted to be here tonight with noted film producer, director, and author Stephen Apcon, who I believe is joining us from uh, upstate New York. Right, Stephen? Right here in the Hudson Valley. Great, great to see you, and thank you for being here at EKU Chautauqua. Thanks for having me. And I'm also happy to be joined on screen tonight uh, by two colleagues from the EKU Department of English, Drs. Jill Parrott and Dom Ashby. Hello to you both, and thank you for being here as well. Jill and Dom are teaching courses here at EKU that use Stephen's book, The Age of the Image, which forms the basis of his presentation tonight. In just a moment, we will turn the screen over to Stephen, and the rest of us will drop off and return for discussion and Q&A. And viewers out there, hello, everyone. I know you're here. I see, uh, see you saying hi, uh, Kelsey and Maylee and Emily and the Fear Cat and others and Stan. Um, you are all invited and encouraged to comment and submit questions right there in the YouTube chat. And we will take them up with Stephen following the presentation. And also for students who may need proof of attendance, we have created a custom QR code and a link that will take you to a Google form where you can sign in and get your proof of attendance. So stay tuned for that toward the conclusion of the presentation. Now you can find Stephen Apcon's full bio in the notes below the screen. So let me just add a couple things here by way of introduction. Stephen Apcon, is a film producer and director and the author of the critically acclaimed book, which I already showed you, The Age of the Image, Redefining Literacy in a World of Screens. And he is the founder and executive director of the Jacob Burn, Burns excuse me, Film Center, a nonprofit film and education organization located in Pleasantville, New York. In The Age of the Image, APCON draws on the history of literacy, on the science of how storytelling works on the human brain, and on the value of literacy in real world situations. And none other than legendary director Martin Scorsese, who wrote the foreword to the book, says, the age of the image lays out the tools we need to cultivate our awareness of and attention to every message and every gesture. It's not just a plea for literacy, but a wonderful roadmap and a guide for how it can be taught and nurtured. And so with that, Welcome again, Stephen, to EKU Chautauqua. We're looking forward to your presentation uh, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Eric. And, and uh, thank you, Jill and Dom for inviting me back again. Uh, last year was a really wonderful experience to be with you. Uh, we had a great conversation with um, students and uh, very grateful to Eastern Kentucky University and to all of you for, uh, for welcoming me back. And I especially want to thank the students uh, and the members of the community who have taken their time out to be here tonight. I know how busy schedules are, and, um, and I'm really grateful for you to be here and to be in conversation. I was supposed to be in person and was really looking forward to it, had my flight set up and everything else. And unfortunately, we're into another year of COVID. And here we are um, having a conversation through mediated technology, and you're back looking at your screens. And... Unfortunately, in this case, I don't even get to see you, uh, which I wish I could, um, but I appreciate you being there. I'd like to, over the next half an hour or so, while we're together, um, share some images and some stories, uh, but I would very much like it to be a conversation. So as you're thinking about questions, please put them in and, and anything you want to tell me about you and, and um, uh, certainly your names and any interest or, or everything would be great. Um, uh, because for me, this really is about a conversation and the connection is really important. And I wanna start with showing you just a two minute clip of a trailer to a film by Godfrey Reggio. It's a film, um, it's a film called Visions. Um, he, he was the director of Koyana Scotsi, among other things. And there's nothing really to, uh, to focus on, but it's sort of just a, a meditation uh, on our way into this conversation. And I'll share with you why I think it's important. And uh, here it is.
So that's the trailer to a, a film called Visitors. Um, and what I love about that is, you know, I was thinking about it as I was watching it and, and hopefully you were watching it and technology was working, is that um, they were engaged in the same thing we were, um, which is one of the most creative acts that we have as human beings. And that's the act of vision, of watching. You see, we, uh, we don't actually see that image that's in front of us. We construct, there are, there are about 100 billion neurons in our brain. And with each image, with each image, every 1 24th of a second, a million or more neurons are firing to, to bring in all kinds of information, color, movement, uh, composition. And what happens actually is we apply that against a database that we have created of knowledge, of visual knowledge, since the first time we open our eyes as babies and look up and hopefully see a smiling parent looking down at us. 85% of our brain is involved in the construction of visual images. And it's not surprising that statistics are that 85% of the internet is engaged in visual images. Um, I had the um, interesting experience as I was writing the book of having my brain studied while watching visual images in fMRI machine. And uh, what was a little bit scary about the prospect of that was it was with a company that had uh, a premise and they were selling uh, their services to movie studios to um, evaluate which trailer would be most likely to get somebody to come to the movie. They were uh, selling their services to fast food companies and other consumer products companies who were hoping to find what they called the buy button in our brains, which visual images and which storytelling would get us to get out of our seats and uh, purchase their product. And it was being used by politicians to evaluate their uh, political media to see which was most likely to impact us as consumers. I don't think there's anything that underscores the importance of a degree of visual literacy than that. It also turns out that many of the neurons that are fired are what we call mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are connected to this notion of empathy. It's interesting that visual images are the closest we get to having the same physiological response we would have as if it was happening to us directly. So for instance, if you're watching a movie and you're seeing somebody being chased, your heart rate is elevated. You can start to sweat. Um, so uh, we're, having, we're having those experiences in large part because of the mirror, mirror neurons. Roger Ebert, the, the great film critic, used to say that movies are an empathy making machine. And there is something magic to that. William James said that emotion is preparation for action. So when we have a feeling based on the visual images we consume, that's what creates that physiological response, which is our preparation for action. Shakespeare talked about the eyes being the gateway to the soul. And there was a really interesting study in 2012 uh, at Yale. Um, and what they did was they looked at a, a, a cohort of people from age four to adults. And what they were trying to get at is where people see themselves. In other words, where, where do they feel that they, their self resides? And they were given you know, images of themselves uh, and images of others. And what they kept coming to was they identified the self in the eyes. Now, you might think that what they're actually doing is saying that it's your brain. They solved for this, tested for this, by having these alien images where they put the brain, the eyes on the chest. And even in those, they went to the eyes. So that is where we experience ourselves because that is how we experience the world. So very, very powerful in terms of uh,
You know, I want to take a step back even before visual images. We, the one thing I believe that we want as human beings is to express ourselves as powerfully as we can. And in fact, when we see something beautiful, a sunset or um, the ocean, uh, or we see something that is upsetting that moves us uh, emotionally, what we want is we want to be able to put somebody into our own bodies to experience what we experience, to see through our eyes, to feel through our hearts. And we haven't yet figured out a way to do that. So instead we created stories, written stories, oral stories, visual stories. And those stories are always mediated because we can't put somebody into our shoes and into our bodies to feel it. It's a mediated experience. So it's important to understand all of the choices that go into that. Let me share a story with you. Um, I, I, I'm going to show you an image and, and a story. So we'll go back here. I was uh, invited um, into the Middle East as I was starting to do some research around a project. And I met a man named Fadi. This is Fadi. And this is the cave that he lived in. He was born in this cave, as was his father and his grandfather. And where he lives in Palestine, there was a lot of conflict uh, between him and, and settlers. And this is Fadi's son. Fadi's son was also born in the same cave. So Fadi is speaking to me in Arabic, being translated to Hebrew, being translated to English. And we're in this cave and it's dark and eventually um, you, your eyes become accustomed to the light. And I realized that there were a whole array of people behind in the cave, just sitting there. People from his family and his community. And he started telling the story of um, trying to get people to understand some of the human rights issues that he was dealing with and how difficult that was. And he said, but he said to me that he had found a new weapon. And as he said that, he reached behind his back and I had no idea at that point what he was gonna pull out. Roddy had been given a camera by a local human rights group and had been taught to shoot. And not only was he documenting this, but he started to talk about the language of film. He talked about composition, about camera movement and placement, long shots, medium shots, close-ups. And he talked about the importance of editing. This was the time when I knew we had entered the age of the image. And in fact, all of the things that he talked about were the essential elements to filmmaking the language and the vocabulary of filmmaking. There's a, an amazingly powerful aspect to a camera, which is that it can be our eyes and move to see things in different places. It can focus in different ways and it can ultimately capture and tell stories. So rather than me share with you um, sort of the basics of editing, I, I wanted to share a very quick uh, piece from the legendary director, Alfred Hitchcock. Now the third way, what one might the assembly of, of film and how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close up, let me show what he said. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, 
girl in a bikini. He's Miles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman. He loves babies. That's what Bill, that's what Bill can do for you. Or you for it, as it were. Alfred Hitchcock was famous for being able to move audiences and create a sense of anxiety, a sense of violence, all with, with images that in each of themselves were benign. He understood that when you place one image next to another, you create meaning. Meaning outside of the meaning that exists within each of those images. A film like Psycho, there's the famous scene of the shower with the knife. And uh, you actually never see a moment of violence, even though it may be one of the most anxiety provoking scenes in all of cinematic history. But it's done through the careful construction of many images that ultimately result in just seeing water in a black and white film, seeing water that seems to be colored as blood going down the drain. And we, the audience, create the meaning. This is important, not just in terms of cinema, but it's important to all of us today, because it doesn't matter what your political affiliation or bent is, whether you believe in certain uh, actions by the United States or, or anybody else. But if we, if we were to look at a war, for instance, let's look at the last war in Afghanistan or Iraq. We had troops, uh, we had media that were embedded with the troops in each of those wars. These reporters witnessed the same events. They were embedded in the same troops. They had the same camera equipment. They were able to film the same things. Yet, if you turned on BBC, Al Jazeera, Fox News, CNN, or any of the other stations, you would see completely different realities of a war. And the realities would be shown to us, the stories, the narratives would be shown to us based on many choices. The choices of where a reporter chose to put their camera, how they framed it, and what was inside the frame, and what's outside the frame. How in the production studio those images were put together with voiceover and narration and everything else to tell a particular story. Now, you guys emerging into this world right now have a much tougher time with it because not only is it the construction of the stories through the use of images, but now even the images themselves are in question. And that's really the area you know, we've taken this whole idea of fake news to a whole different extreme. It's much scarier to think of fake visual news. We have this idea that the eyes don't lie, right? To see it is to believe it. Yeah, that's a very interesting meme today. Deep fakes first appeared in 2017 as a term of artificial intelligence. And it was a question of could machines create fake images to have us and fake stories to have us believe them to be accurate? And I could show you many deep fakes. I'm sure that many of you have seen them yourselves. Probably some of them at one point thought were real, may still. Um, I'm going to tell you about two documentaries. And I, documentaries to me are very interesting because documentaries are meant to be truthful. I was going to say factual, but I would say at least truthful. And even if not in a chronological truth, in an emotional truth. And two great celebrated documentary filmmakers recently um, uh, used the idea of a deep fake in different ways. So the first was um, a filmmaker named Warner Herzog, who um, uh, has an extraordinary career, German director, 
uh, many, many films, highly recommend him. But he was doing a film, he was making a film called Bells from the Deep about um, mysticism in Russia. And it turned out after the film was released that people began to understand that he had paid two Siberian men who were drunk to lie on the ice and pretend to be pilgrims that were listening for chimes from a lost city under the sea. And it was very poetic, but he, he played them off as actual pilgrims doing this. And you might say, uh, you know, what was the harm? But it's a really interesting fine line in terms of the way we tell stories. More recently, Morgan Neville was doing a film called Roadrunner about Anthony Bourdain. It was out over this last year. You might have seen it. Um, it's been streaming. And what he did was he took, um, he took emails that Anthony Bourdain had written um, before his suicide, and he used an AI voice to have Anthony Bourdain reading those emails himself, again, without disclosing it. Now, those seem relatively benign, but there's much more sinister things that are happening and can happen, and you can only imagine what's possible. Again, remember William James, emotion is preparation for action. The, uh, many of you probably uh, are, are avid consumers of TikTok, um, another place in which means are created and language and vocabulary is created and the conversation goes on over time. This is uh, what we've become. So, so literacy as it emerges is, it first emerges in the receptive side because the tools of creation reside within the few. When television first came about, we had three networks. And they told all the stories, and we had to learn to consume them. But eventually, we had a proliferation of networks and streaming services and everything else. The language of storytelling became more democratic. And so today, with a phone, we have more technology of uh, filmmaking in this phone and editing than we had in you know million dollars of, uh, of technology and studios. So the new forms of literacy move from not just the receptive side, but the expressive side. It becomes as important for us to tell our stories in a powerful and a compelling way as possible as it is to. So I wanna take this back now to a human level, or maybe we could say a, a humane level. And I wanna share with you a trailer to a film called First to the Moon um, about Apollo 8. American astronauts, Borman, Lovell, and Andrews are whirling about the moon on this Christmas Eve, further away from home than man has ever been. At the time that we did it, I don't think we fully understood the significance of the very first flight to the moon. All right, you are go for PLI, all right? Roger, and we're going for PLI. When you stop to think about the mission we were given. We choose to go to the moon. That was a remarkable challenge. I remember looking down through the grating and thinking, yeah, this is a big rocket. Yeah, it's kind of eerie to go down to that big Saturn V on launch day. It's literally about five and a half million pounds of high explosive. Launch vehicle almost came alive. I only got scared twice in a flight and the launch was wrong. Zero, we have First flight on the Saturn V, first to leave the Earth, so there, you know, there really wasn't much to wring your hands about. I thought we had about one chance in three of having successful mission. The greatest accomplishment was doing what the president had asked us to do within the time frame that he asked us to. 
what did it really mean getting a, a true perspective where we were, three guys just 240,000 miles from the earth. Something caught my eye out of my window and I said, hey, look at that. And it turned out to be the earth coming up over the stark winter horizon. And I thought, you know, how insignificant we all are. Everybody I ever knew, five billion people could be behind my thumb as I put it up. I think it's ironic that we went all the way to the moon to explore the moon. What we really discovered was the earth. That image that you saw, Earthrise, very famous image, this is the big blue marble. A singular image changed our consciousness of who we were as human beings. Well before Jeff Bezos put William Shatner up in space for four minutes, uh, arguably space, although maybe not. Um, and yet this shift in consciousness was also this pale blue dot, if you look up at the band, the, the sort of pink band, and you'll see a pale little blue dot, that's Earth. So film, visual images has the opportunity to tell powerful stories in singular images and move us as we put them together in moving images in a way that shifts our understanding of who we are as an individual and as a species. Let me zoom back in for a minute and get to a more human scale. And I want to share with you the trailer to a film that I spent three years in the Middle East directing, a film about a group of Palestinian fighters and Israeli soldiers. And I'll tell you a little bit about the construction of it, but first let me share the trailer. I was four years old when we were attacked on Yom Kippur. I remember us running to the shelter in Tel Aviv. It's very concrete for a child. They want to kill us. And I really didn't understand why do they hate us so much? <laughs> I was admitted into the most prestigious units in the Israeli army. I was extremely proud. I knew my father was proud. We find that we actually have something in common. That willingness to kill people you don't know. There's so much I could tell you about that film. Um, there's just a couple of things I want to share. First, it is constructed of four different elements of direct cinema or verite footage of them in action. 
of interviews, um, of uh, archival footage, and of visualizations to go back into the uh, emotional experience, the psychological experience of each of the characters. Um, one thing I would say is that the film was a very challenging film to make because it was decidedly we wanted to make a film that didn't have a villain. And virtually every movie you will see um, has an identified villain and a hero. It's just the way that movies seem to work in, in a Hollywood formula. But we wanted to make a film in which the villain was the narrative itself. So people would say to us, is this film pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian? And we would say, yes, it's pro, it's pro-human. Uh, what's also fascinating about visual storytelling is that it operates on many levels. So when you are constructing a story, uh, you're telling um, sort of the, the surface level of the story. Something happens, somebody responds, there's movement. But when you can tap into universal ideas of what it means to be human, it transcends just that surface level. So this film we traveled with for two years afterward all around the world. Uh, and it continues to be used. In, and actually, we are doing a series of workshops with a group from Hong Kong who reached out, haven't seen the film. And they're using this film now in Hong Kong to deal with the divide in their own communities and what political realities there. And what they say to us consistently is that this film is not about them, it's about us. And so when we're telling stories or making films, it's always thinking about all of the different levels at which it can be received, which it can be felt. And the idea for us is not just to tell a story, but to create a felt experience. Something else that's very powerful about the cameras and about visual storytelling is the ability to play with time and scale. You can slow things down or speed them up, see things that we would never have the patience to see evolve, or see things small enough that we can't see them with our human eye. And uh, most recently, our, our, our latest film, which is, is on Netflix now, is a film called Fantastic Fungi. It's about the intelligence of nature, the importance of mycelium in the fungal kingdom as a partner in solving many of our environmental issues, and also about a shifting consciousness. And uh, it plays very much with time and scale. And I thought I would share that with you right now. My mission is to discover the language of nature, and I believe nature is intelligent. There is a world under the earth, full of magic and mystery. It holds the consciousness of nature's connection to all living things. You know, these mushrooms, they can heal you, they can feed you, they can kill you. It's not like a vegetable, and it's not like an animal, but it's somewhere in between. They support life, they convert life. As you're walking through, it's about 300 miles of fungi. Under every footstep that you take, and that's all over the world. The bulk of the organism is growing underground, and it's composed of these long threads called a mycelium. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. It's amazing what we don't know about mushrooms. They really are a frontier of knowledge. You can filter water. You can create medicinal compounds almost on demand. They have incredible capacity to make things change very quickly. So I am super hopeful. The psychedelic members of the mushroom kingdom are fascinating. I have been a guide for around 350 psilocybin sessions. The most glorious part was that it made me feel more comfortable with living because you're not afraid of dying. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? We can heal the planet. We can build the future. And our world is fantastic. So, uh, 
I have one more um, one more thing I'd love to share with you, really as a gift. Um, that I think is just a beautiful way of of understanding the power of images, the uh, way in which they can move us, create emotion, create joy, um, sadness. Um, but I think I'll hold off on that for a few minutes uh, because what I'm missing is the connection with all of you and the conversation that we could have. So um, Eric, I'd love to open this up for, um, for a Q&A for any questions that anybody has and, and then maybe along the way can share a few more things. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen Apcon, for uh, what's already been a fascinating discussion and sharing your insights, right, that you have gleaned as a filmmaker and producer and somebody who's thought quite deeply about, you know, the, these issues and the sort of world in which we are all living now, right, surrounded by screens, bombarded by images and visual storytelling of various sorts, mm -hmm. you know, from the ways... Uh, in which we connect with each other, ways in which we're, you know, being sold things in a variety of ways and how we have to arm ourselves against that too. You know, the creative side and the healing side as, you know, uh, several of your trailers um, uh, hinted at. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanna encourage our viewers out there. Uh, I know we've got a bunch of students as well as some, uh, uh, faculty and community members out there, Jake and Cameron and Tyler and Jason and Fred and Melissa and so on, please do share some questions and comments for Stephen. Um, but I want to welcome uh, back to the screen Dom and Jill and see if they might have a comment or a question to kind of get us started here. Not to put one of you on the spot per se, but go ahead, Dom. Sure. Yeah, if I could go ahead and start. I, I was was thanking Stephen about your your comment early on in the beginning of your of your discussion about this idea of um, this this human drive to share experiences to share emotions right that we see something and we want to be able to share it and I think that you've really shown that beautifully to us how through the examples of the the trailers and the projects that you worked on um, how through the the image and through digital editing that we're able to do this now through with video and and with sound. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe connecting some of these ideas to ways of using the still image and how this is also a way of sharing emotion and of and of how the the, the composition and the creative process is still inherent to, with with that as well. You know, I think about the my own work with with students in my classes, um, it can be a little bit harder to work with them with editing video, right? It takes more of a, a bigger a bigger time investment and classroom investment to do that. Whereas with the the access to the to the smartphone and of simple blogging software and and social media and such, images are just so fast and we can share them so quickly while they also last as well, right? Through this sort of, you know, the, the archive that is, that is created through, through social media. But you know, again, we, we're, it seems like we're all constantly, you know, I look back every, you know, at least once a day through some of the images I've taken on my phone and there's this inter interesting juxtaposition that's happening just almost naturally from the images that accrue over time very rapidly on my smartphone, right? That's a sharing of emotion, that's a sharing of ideas. Um, so I think that's fascinating too, and I know it, it ties in a little bit to sort of the montage effect that Churchill was, or um, or that um, not Churchill, <laughs> um, with the the example from your um, from the um, Hitchcock, Hitchcock, yes, um, that that Hitchcock was giving of if we were just if we're juxtaposing um, film together, right? I mean, we can get a similar thing with juxtaposition of still of still images. Yeah. I love that you said Churchill. <laughs> because, well, well, because it, it shows us how quickly we make decisions on, on visual images and we, uh, we apply them to the images that we know in the database that we've created. And if Hitchcock is a Churchillian kind of figure, you know, looking. So, uh, so it makes complete sense. Uh, but yes, I think, Dom, that, that, that uh, still images are a very, very powerful way to, um, to, to understand both the, the, um, 
the visual language and to be able to find our, our eyes and to build the muscles of how do we tell stories. And so the composition of moving images is really just a series of still images. Where do you choose to put the camera? Um, and what story do you choose to tell? And it's, it's that gaze that you have toward a subject. And it can be for, toward, you know, it doesn't have to, it can be toward an inanimate object, you know, or it could be toward a human being. And, uh, and they can both create emotion. You know, that image of Earthrise, uh, to me, you know, could bring me to tears. Um, and the NASA footage that we see, but also these iconic images, whether they're from past wars or political actions, or even just um, somebody that you pass by on the street or on the train or on the bus. And so digital storytelling is enormously powerful. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, we have these, these cameras and we can, we can learn to use them and we can develop our eye. And, um, and so I had this experience with um, great documentary filmmaker, Albert Mazels. He's one of the great American documentary filmmakers. He passed away several years ago made a film called Salesman and Great Gardens and a number of other films. And what I learned from Al was that you can have the exact same technology and forget about, like I said, with, with the reporters where they're choosing to shoot different things and everything else. You could have the same technology. You could frame it the same way, light it the same way, shoot the exact same thing. And I don't know how else to explain this, but to say that it's magic which is that if you show up in an open-hearted way and you use the word connection and connect to what you're filming or capturing in your camera, it will uh, translate into a very different experience on the screen. So literally you're shooting the exact same thing, but if you have shown up fully, Al used to fall in love with each of the subjects that he would shoot because he saw the depth of their humanity. And that's a gift that you give to the subjects, but it's also a gift that you give to yourself. So it, it does come down to that authentic experience of connection that gets captured in still images, moving images, and just in the way in which we connect with each other on a daily basis. Thank and you. I, I love that. I, I like that. Ahead, I like that idea too of almost like um, uh, sort of a mindfulness in a way too, right? Of, of being more fully aware through the lens in that way. Very much. So. Thank you. Thank you. If I can sort of tie that into a or in with a comment that Stan left, um, you know, you were speaking of the very positive side of investing emotionally and empathetically in what you're looking at, what you're seeing, what you're filming, what you're capturing, and what you want to communicate. Um, Stan comments that, you know, this, the power, right, of the visual image, right, is certainly great, but it's also like a double-edged sword. It can be used benevolently, but also malevolently. Yes. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking back to, of course, the origins of filmmaking and propaganda of various sorts, Laney Riefenstahl and others. Right. And so, um, you know, that's one thing I might ask you to comment on about that, that sort of negative propagandistic side to manipulate and or twist. Right. Is the way another um, uh, person out there put it. You know, this was with respect to. I think um, at the time when you were talking about uh, embedded reporters yes. and the different ways in which they would, you know, send their stories back, frame them and, and communicate them in a variety of ways. So, you know, narratives can get twisted and be used propagandistically for, you know, various purposes. So what might you say about that? And then also as a second point, you know, what are the dangers of when AI gets involved in, creating, you know, what it is you see on your screen and how it lures you in, you know, to a set of constructed images, you know, for various purposes. Yeah, uh, they're both great questions. Um, thanks for that, Stan. I think that um, manipulation is the right word. 
and uh, and we can understand it on the negative side by by understanding it on the more positive or or productive side. In other words, every piece of media is a manipulation. When I'm sitting in the editing room with a film like Disturbing the Peace, I'm making very specific choices about where a sequence ends and where it begins, what music's underneath it, um, what story do I choose to tell, and what emotions am I hoping to create? So there's a responsibility, even in doing it for good, let's say, there's a responsibility of understanding that you are creating a mediated, manipulated experience. And there's, a, there's an ethical responsibility. As I said before, we're past the question of truth because we've already made decisions about what story to tell and how we're going to tell it. So the ethical responsibility for me is around emotional truth. Now, that sense of manipulation, not only could it be, is regularly being used in our media and elsewhere to move us emotionally. And I think it is one of the most challenging things we face as a society today is the polarization and the, the essentially the media that is creating stories that we want to consume. And they're very often not about uh, truth. The challenge is how do we as consumers understand that? And the first thing is an awareness of that, an awareness of the fact that they're manipulations and that they're mediated. And this is why it's so important to have the experience of trying to edit something, even if it is, you know, a, a video for for um, a partner's uh, birthday or, you know, an anniversary or, or telling the story of your children or whatever it is, to understand the power of putting Im one image against another image and creating another meaning. It becomes even more challenging with AI and deep fakes. And I wish I had an easy answer to it. I actually believe that uh, one thing that could be very powerful would be for uh, media channels to have to release the, um, the editing timeline of all of their pieces so that we can see cut, 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 audio beneath it, all of the things that we can see that it's a construction. And that could be the visual cue to us to think about the construction and who the storyteller is and what their agenda might be. It becomes even more difficult with the deep fake though. And so we have to become very, uh, we have to become very educated about what's possible and we have to be very discerning and ask the hard questions. It, it will require so much more work um, for us as consumers of media. How do you get people who are hooked on certain types of media because they're getting a dopamine response, they're getting pleasure, they like it, to understand or appreciate that they're also at the same time being manipulated? Look, I, I, I don't know whether any of you have seen Social Dilemma. But uh, a great documentary, I highly recommend it. And it looks at exactly that, Eric. It looks at the way in which, um, you know, social media platforms are giving us, are basically, you know, creating addictions, creating that dopamine response and giving us what we want. And of course, you know, we've all heard the story that all of the, um, the Silicon Valley titans that have created these technologies don't let their kids anywhere near this media, anywhere near this technology. Yeah, that's and, very revealing. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jill, I want to give you an opportunity to jump in here if you'd like while I take another look at other comments and questions. If you want, sure. Go I actually had a lovely question that used the words responsibility and consumer and producer, and you already talked about 
<laughs> so I'll skip that when you already sort of talked about my thing. I have a much simpler question, actually. Um, so that the image of the the blue marble, the the, the earth earth image, uh, got me thinking. You know, that's very powerful. What are some some images that you've seen really recently in the media that are standing out to you and um, uh, giving you that connection and in the truth? No, oh, that's such a good question. I'll give you a funny one because it's an image that I saw yesterday. And it was the image of the, um, of, I forget what the name of the, of the, the space company it is that Jeff Bezos has, but um, it was the image of the spaceship on the landing platform, on the launch um, pad with William Shatner in it. And um, all I can say is, go and look at the image of that spaceship on the launch pad. And um, it, uh, it has a certain anatomical reference that um, says something about the patriarchy and, uh, and our desire for power and privilege. And that's an image that, that I just started laughing at looking at saying, boy, we, we really are something. It's something that might have made it into the fantastic fungi film, but wouldn't really fit. Yeah, there there are mushrooms that look like that. Mushrooms. But, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, here's a question from Kelsey. Um, going back to the fellow you met, and I've also forgotten his name. That in Afghanistan, um, did he ever get to share his films uh, widely, it's or in nice. what in what venues has he shared his films? Kelsey, that's such a great question. Um, so he was he was given that camera and taught to use it by a, a human rights organization called B'Tselem. And uh, it's an Israeli human rights organization. And they had been around for decades and they had reporters and they were reporting constantly um, about human rights issues. And they could not get anybody to pay attention. All of a sudden, when they started sharing these cameras with people, people like Fadi, and they had these stories documented, all of a sudden, all the news shows were showing them. They wanted the footage and they were telling the stories and they were making a change on the ground. Let me bring that to current times. The, the, consume, the, the, the um, civilian generated Im documentary images of things like George Floyd change our culture. They are undeniable. And so we understand that if the camera wasn't there, there would be a different outcome. And uh, that underscores the power of, uh, of images. Yeah, it speaks to a kind of witness and testimony, right? And um... As I think one of the um, people, a young woman in the other film uh, trailer put it, you know, I asked myself, what was my purpose in life? Yeah. Right. And there's this sense that, you know, partly we're here to be witnesses and to testify. But as, as you put it also, right, not just to capture things, but to be creative and think about how we're doing that. Um, and so glad, connected. Glad sorry, you mentioned, Rick, I was just going to say, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Shifa was the woman you were talking about in the Disturbing the Peace film. I'm glad you mentioned her only because today is her birthday. And this is a woman who was hours away from detonating herself as a suicide bomber, um, leaving behind a six-year-old daughter uh, until uh, hours before um, she was putting the vest on, she was captured by the Israeli military. And um, in prison, one of her prison guards um, lost their brother to an act of violence. And she assumed this prison guard, when she came back from her mourning period, was going to take it out on her. And instead, she turned to her and she said, you know, we're all human beings and um, you suffer the same way I suffer. And that changed her whole orientation to understanding humanity. And that's the power we all have for each other. And the ability to tell that story allows that essence to ripple out into the world. And that's you know, that's something that we can offer each other. 
Thank you. She's now a grandmother. And happy birthday to her. Yeah, that's wonderful. A wonderful transformation. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I'm pronouncing this right. Reich or Reek 333 um, has a comment and a question here about the contrast between the types of films that you are involved in, which are very, you know, um, meditative and you, you get into, he, you know, heavy detail and they're um, elaborately, uh, you know, told. Uh, that type of witness or testimony on the one hand, and then a TikTok on the other hand, these sort of quick cuts, shortcut, um, you know, quick release uh, videos. You know, what is your take on not just the contrast between those two things, but maybe the utility or the lack thereof of TikTok, you know, uh, in relation to what's really going on around us? You know, is it, what, what do you think is this sort of, what are the vices and virtues of TikTok, I guess is the way to put it. Yeah, so I have to admit, I'm not a big TikTok consumer. Although I I, um, I certainly have seen you know my share of of TikTok videos from uh, you know our kids sharing them and recreating them and and I think to me what it speaks to is how culture is created and how memes are created and so what's fascinating to me about TikTok is the conversation that's going on and so it starts with somebody's uh, you know creative impulse to put something up something that happens with their dog or something, you know, a, a dance move or whatever it is. And then to see how ubiquitous it becomes as it spreads through our culture and, and there's commentary on it and there's conversation. And over time, what you'll find is that is the, the, the references back to other memes. And so I think from a sociological perspective, it's really interesting. Um, and, you know, there is some storytelling element to it in terms of, you know, the framing of the camera and all of that stuff. But obviously, um, you know, less complex. Um, but you know, so uh, let me find something to share with you. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to go over here. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, and Dom and Jill, feel free to jump in anytime you wish. Um, so I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm gonna share something with you. Okay. So, okay. So this is bonus content for everybody out there watching. Yeah. I do have another thing that I really wanna share, but this is, let's see here. Okay. So, so this is the early internet. Cat videos are one of the most popular things on YouTube, okay? But let's go back to the early cinema. And this is um, footage from uh, early cinema. Cat boxing. You can't make this stuff up. So my point is that um, as new tools of creation emerge, you know, they have to find their way and we have to learn a degree of literacy. Um, and people just being able to film stuff, upload it, all of that is just the start. But I think that what we're gonna see is we're gonna see a generation of people who are much more sophisticated uh, in the media that they create. And I'm really excited about that. I think that it is as important for us to be able to express ourselves in a powerful and compelling way as it is to, um, to critically look at the stories we're being fed. Let me ask a question um, from Stardock Play. Uh, how can we as storytellers ensure that we don't spread harmful themes? Hmm, great question.
Al Mazels again said something to me once that um, stories can be more important than oxygen. It's what we give to each other to take care of each other, um, to alleviate suffering and to recognize our common humanity. And so the stories we choose to share are the gifts that we give to each other. And, um, and we should choose them wisely. You know, I, I believe, so our, our nonprofit organization Reconsider is very focused on this notion that we tend to identify the, um, the diseases of our time. So the threats to humanity, for instance, whether it's climate change, you know, environmental issues, global warming, or conflict areas, or the treatment of women, or racial inequality, or economic inequality. And we, as a society, we throw time and money and resources to try to fix them. And what we've come to understand and believe is that they're not the disease, they're the symptoms of the disease. And the disease, if you will, is our disease, our disconnection from ourselves, from each other, from the natural world, and ultimately from life itself. The crisis that we're in is a crisis of consciousness. And our ability to use uh, our gifts of storytelling to delve into that and to create authentic connections and stories that are meaningful, um, to me, is the only response that we can have. Or that the only response that's meaningful. In a way connected to that, Jason asks a question about you know, the phenomenon of if the camera wasn't there. Yeah. Right. And uh, he wants to know, you know, to what degree is that connected to the U.S. experience recently, you know, associated with COVID suffering such immense mortality? And could public health issues better um, show reality and respect privacy? Jason, that is an amazing question. Um... Yes. It's a simple answer, yes. I mean, I, look, if you go back to the Vietnam War, um, when I was growing up on the seven o'clock news every night, you would see the coffins with American flags being unloaded from the planes. During the Persian Gulf War, the presidential administration at that time made a decision to not allow cameras anywhere near that because they didn't want us to understand what the cost of that war was. Similarly, if you apply it to healthcare or any of those things, to tell the authentic stories of the suffering and what's possible, um, there's no question that it can have a huge impact. And I think that if, if I were to, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, put it on the media for a moment, but I'm not gonna leave it there. Because if we turn on all of these channels, we're being fed. Um, I mean, look, we traveled around the world for two years with Disturbing the Peace. And one of the questions we asked in each Q and A was, who knows the Hubble deep shots, the deep field shots? And virtually no one raised their hand. These were the shots where they took the Hubble telescope and they pointed to the darkest part of the universe. And all of a sudden what emerged was billions of galaxies that we didn't know. And then we asked who knows who the Kardashians are. The media is giving us what we want to consume. I always said, you know, they're looking for inexpensive programming that will drive revenues. And the way that our media works is it's advertising driven. So we have to make better decisions about what we consume. And I think it's very much um, a factor, Jason, in the stories that, that can be told around healthcare crises and other things that can have a, a more positive impact on the way that we understand ourselves and what's possible. Great question. Thank you. I'm um, looking for another question that I know was here. Yes, uh, Camilla or Camila, um, wants to know more about what inspired you to write The Age of the Image. And I'll say that many students have commented on here 
uh, not just about the assignments they've been given on your book, but how much they like the book. But they oh. love the book. So I want to pass those along. And you can see those in the YouTube chat later if you want to look. But, you know, you mentioned, of course, uh, Fadi and how important that was in getting you to appreciate the age of the image as a, a concept or an era, right, that we're in. But what else can you say about the inspiration for writing the book? The inspiration for me for writing the book was, uh, was uh, over a decade of, of thinking about this and being very deeply engaged in this work and a desire to have this conversation. So uh, I wanted to write the book to have nights like tonight, to be able to talk about um, storytelling, talk about what's important and talk about the stories we want to share with each other and, and we want to tell. You know, as I was writing the book, I had, I had uh, 20 years ago, I started a nonprofit film and education center called the Jacob Burns Film Center. And, um, and as I was finishing the book, my father, sent me an image that he, I mean, he was a photographer. I grew up with him as a photographer and grew up in the dark room. And, and uh, he, he was great because um, he would take us to the local dump on the weekends and we'd have our cameras and he would tell these most amazing stories looking for things that people had thrown away. And you develop, he, did, he had this amazing eye. He has this amazing eye to be able to tell those stories. But he sent me, um, a picture um, and then called me and talked to me about how he had been going through boxes in the basement from his mother who had passed away, my grandmother. And she had been a refugee from um, Eastern Europe and wasn't allowed into the United States because of quotas. And so she went to Havana, Cuba and met her husband, my grandfather there and, uh, and ultimately came to the United States. But when he was going through her belongings, he found what looked like a passport and he opened it up. And there was the picture of my grandmother and it was her um, student ID from the Warsaw Film School in the 20s. And next to it was her transcript of directing and cinematography and set design. She had never told anybody about this. A woman in the 20s in film school and I realized that on one level, what inspired me was to have these conversations and the work that I had done. And on the other was a conversation that I had been having for many years with my grandmother that um, I didn't quite know I was having until that moment. It's a wonderful connection. I happen to have it here. Do you mind if I share it for pe with people? Know. Okay, if you can see that. There's an image of that student ID photo. Yeah. And it brought me to tears when I saw it. This is a great moment to, to share with you this gift that I, I shared last year. And I just love sharing with audiences because I can't think of anything more human or more delightful in terms of the way that, that uh, images can move us. And it's a very short piece, but do you mind if I share that now? Please go ahead. And then I'll just let everybody out there know we've got just a couple more minutes. If you have a final comment or question for Stephen, um, please get that in now. Go okay. ahead. Okay, here we go. The moment was, how would you define a moment? I, I, can't, I can't even say. I don't know. Ask me something simple. A moment at normal time. Normal time is this. What is a moment, though? Honestly. It's that thing. It's, that, it's beyond the senses. Moment. I don't know.
That's very moving for sure. Mm. I love that question. What is a moment, you know, and not to answer it necessarily, but it, it, it's clearly something you pay attention to and that you define by that attention and that you create. And it's also always there waiting for you. And uh, I love how the montage, right? Just the constant juxtaposition of things communicates that so well. You know, any one of those things doesn't seem that significant, but when you put them all together, they all take on added meaning. Yeah. So I just, that was great. Thank you for sharing that. Welcome. Thanks for watching it. Um, I, you know, I will also just share one thing myself related to your comment about, you know, your father and uh, noticing and observing things in mundane surroundings and, you know, using that as a way of attending to things and making something special right out of what's at hand. You know, many of us in the past year and a half have spent a lot of time at home or <laughs> in, in, you know, close confines. And my wife and I had to spend two weeks over the Christmas break when we went back to Canada, we had to quarantine for two weeks on a, you know, it was, wasn't a terribly small property, but it was just one space for two weeks. Yeah. And partly what got us through was a little game we developed of basically observation and attention. And every time we took a walk around the little backyard, we tried to find something new that we hadn't yet noticed. Yeah. You know, and I, it wasn't with a cinematographer's eye necessarily, but it, it was, it really allowed us to invest, you know, that time with, with something that, you know, is always there. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, we do have, okay, one more question that came in, uh, as well as some comments about that montage, like, wow. Um, and thank you, and thank you. Uh, ben wants to know, what are your thoughts on some of the more nuanced storytelling that goes on in video games? Mm. That's a great question, Ben. You know, it's um, video games, first of all, have become much more cinematic, uh, much more immersive. Um, and, uh, and, and the world of visu visual reality, VR as well. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and I think that there's really powerful ways to utilize that. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, not, not so dissimilar to way you're using fantastic fungi in some ways. There's a, there's a series called Moving Art on Netflix, which is basically images of nature and it's meditative. Um, and it's, it's immersive. Um, it's, not, it's not story driven the way that video games are. And I think that one of the things that's, that's very powerful about video games today is not only that they become more cinematic, but they become much more story driven. And so, and they're looking for playability and can you be immersed in this environment for a long time and want to come back? And uh, so I think there's really interesting work that's being done around it. Um, I would love to see, you know, even more creative, um, uh, more uh, social positive kind of uh, stories emerging in that realm. But I think that VR is, is very powerful and, uh, and video games as well. Thank you very much. And uh, with a quick look uh, to Dom and Jill to see if they have any final comment or question. Um, you don't have to. <laughs> I was just, um, as maybe uh, after you make the transition to our QR code, maybe oh, while yes. you're doing that, Stephen can tell us um, where we can all watch your movies. I've seen Disturbing the Peace. It's wonderful. I haven't seen the Mushroom movie. <laughs> yeah, fabulous, Bungie. But um, uh, can you tell everybody uh, where to, to find some of that? Absolutely. So you could go to our website, reconsider.org to get links to anything. Um, Disturbing the Peace just came off of uh, several years on Netflix, but it is available on, on streaming platforms. Um, uh, our first uh, film, Planetary, which has a lot of NASA footage as well and is really beautiful meditation on what does it mean for us to be planetary. You can also access from the same place on our website. And Fantastic Fungi is um, is currently, I think, the number one documentary on Netflix. It, it was the number three film in the first several months it was on. And, um, and it's interesting because we actually had a, an opportunity to, to put it on Netflix when it first came out two years ago. And we people thought we were crazy, but we really wanted to be able to have conversations with people in theaters. That was back when people went to theaters. Do you remember those times? Um, 
they will be back again. But uh, what was really important to us was, you know, watching movies collectively, it's like, it is like going into a dream state. You know, the, 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 the lights go out and you're sitting there in this dark space and these images are washing over you. And to do that collectively is very powerful. And I really look forward to the opportunity for when we'll be able to do that again. And, um, and so we decided to forego that Netflix offer and, um, and had two years of, of uh, bringing it into theaters and really amazing experiences. And when we brought it um, into international markets, we were going to do a screening the same day at 500 films um, globally as a kickoff to the international screening. And of course, that was in March of 20. 20 um, and everything shut down um, just before that and we we pivoted and we decided to do an online screening and what was amazing was you know uh think about the the number of people here right now connected with each other and we had between 35 and 50 thousand people around the world on zoom and literally, we're able to answer questions from somebody in Bogota, Colombia, uh, and the next question from Beirut, Lebanon. And what we did at the end was to, and we could do it here right now, actually, is to just take a moment and realize that we may all be looking at a screen in our own boxes or wherever we happen to reside in this moment. But the desire to share this time together to be connected, uh, to have a shared experience is really powerful. And um, even though I can't see each of you other than you, Jill and Dom and, and Eric, um, all the people who participated tonight, um, Stardust, Stardoc, uh, Stan, Jason, all of the people who had questions and all the people who just tuned in to to create this experience together. This was a co-creation for all of us. And, um, you know, when I set out to write this book, it, as I said, it was to have these kind of conversations. And so just to feel for a moment, that sense of, of shared humanity, whatever our life experiences have been, and to be in this moment together, um, I'm very grateful for. So thank you. Thank you. So are we, Stephen. It's been a blessing to have you here tonight, uh, you know, to share your experience and your wisdom and your vision and uh, your thoughts. Um, thank you also, Jill and Dom, and thank you to everybody out there watching. Um, you'll see that I have already put a link uh, in the YouTube chat to a Google form. Uh, if you want to try that, uh, you can enter your name and uh, email address and your professor's name for proof of attendance. I'm also now going to share my screen. You should see a QR code that should enable you to take a quick uh, picture of that. And that will also take you to that Google form. Um, if you have any troubles with this, uh, feel free to write me, eric.ladell at eku.edu and I'll help you sort it out. <laughs> Um, but uh, let's see, I'll leave that up there for another few seconds. Um, otherwise, uh, once again, everybody, thank you for being here. Thank you, Stephen Apcon, for joining us from upstate New York. Thank you, Dr. Jill Parrott and Dr. Dom Ashby from uh, the EKU Department of English. Thank you to the students out there and to our campus and community uh, viewers as well. You know, you can always find out everything about EKU Chautauqua on our website, and you can follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter for updates. And we'll see you back here next week uh, when we will be welcoming the Arbornaut, Canopy Meg Loman, um, who's got a brand new book out about her life spent climbing trees uh, to get up into the treetops. She calls it the eighth continent mm -hmm. um, up there in the treetops. And so that'll be next Thursday night here at EKU Chautauqua. And so uh, with that, um, good night, everybody. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>